Thank you. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the work I've done over the last 50 years or so. Um, and then I think we'll have a discussion after in questions. So uh, I divide my work uh, into three segments. The first is BC, which I call before computers, then AD, which is after digital, and now it's going back into BC, but for biological computing. And uh, as I say, I'm just going to show a few uh, things that I've done over, over time. And uh, these are breathing machines. Um, some of these are upstairs. Uh, I like to think that my most relevant work was born on the cusp of disaster. For example, in 1971, I was invited to do a show at a museum in Berkeley because they were threatened to have their funding cuts uh, cut unless they showed a woman, and it was federal funding. So uh, I, they wanted drawings, but I showed these pieces. These were pieces that would, had sensors and would talk or would breathe. You would walk up to them, and they would react to you. These, these are self-portraits of me done in wax, um, and uh, they closed the exhibition. And the reason that they closed the exhibition was because it used sound. Now, I didn't know at the time that nobody had ever done that. It just seemed to me that it was so natural, you know, because sound is like a drawing and it goes out into space. And uh, putting in a sensor in those days was reacting to, you know, interacting with people that would come up to it. And uh, in, in my sense, it was a little bit uh, Duchampian in that, in that way. But they said it was it, it didn't belong in the museum. They actually closed the show down in two days and took everything out. So um, in res response to that, and on the cusp of, uh, uh, of what could be a catastrophe, I had a little bit of an idea. But around that same time, I was doing the breathing machine. I was always also doing these kinds of drawings and paintings, which were about cyborgs and about human machines. So after I uh, um, was kicked out of the museum, uh, I thought, well, who needs one anyway? And what I did was occupy a hotel room. I went to a very inexpensive place in the North Beach section of San Francisco, and I rented a room. And the room was available 24 hours a day, every day. And um, you see the receipt here, I think it was... $10 a week. And the way this worked was that you would go to the hotel, sign in at the desk, and you would get a uh, key to go into the room. And in the room were artifacts of somebody that might have lived there. Um, it was encased with, with objects from around the location of that space. And, uh, and people it became a very popular exhibition. Um, it, it had sound. Uh, coming from the closet and breathing and these wax figures in the room. And in fact, the room lasted uh, almost a year. Somebody came in the middle of the night and saw these um, this figure in bed and, and thought it was dead and called the police. And the police came and took everything to central headquarters and that was the end of that exhibition. So, and so when... I had this exhibition that really became the genesis of this next project because um, I thought, what if you were to liberate the essence of a character who might have stayed in the room but could go out and have ex real experiences in real life in real time? And that was the way this character was born. Her name was Roberta Brightmore. She lived for t almost 10 years. She, I consider her a private performance done in public. I had to do research on what her background, her education, her traumas uh, were, and and she was accumulated in, into a, a psychological stereotype, stereotype of, of information. Roberta saw a psychiatrist, used a specific language, had a unique handwriting, uh, secured checking accounts, uh, and credit cards, which I couldn't. And she had a driver's license, and she, if you go back to that particular time, she's more real than I am, because there's more of a history for her. There were literally hundreds of 
of artifacts and discards that defined who she who she was. I even hired a surveillance photographer to trail her because she would put ads in the newspaper for roommates. She would have a job. She would go out and have adventures. Uh, you know, uh, and, and as people became unwitting participants to, in her adventure, she became part of the reality of their life. Um, so I consider her a breathing sim uh, simulacra, a person played first by myself and then by a series of multiples. And as they say, she existed in real life, in real time, and um, engaged in, in many adventures and typified and a, was a witness to simultaneously the experience of living uh, during that time. In fact, she did see a psychiatrist to have her psychiatric records. I just talked to him recently about what that was like. Uh, and she became a mirror of that culture that she lived with, lived inside of it, inside of. Um, so uh, people were voyeurs. Um, in a sense, to Roberta's existence. And I have her work as archived. And when you look at some of the things that she went through, you could read letters of people that wrote to her, photographs of people who were with her. In a sense, you're re-performing now and forever that experience of what it was like for her to live during that time. Now, so I was kind of playing with identity at that time. And during that time also, I, uh, created these three fictional critics. Uh, it was not only difficult for women to show in art galleries, but almost impossible for women to be written about. So um, I created these names, the, these critics that wrote under different styles. One's name was Herbert Good, one was Prudence Juris, and one was Gay Abandon. And uh, they would write for international text or have a weekly column or write for throwaway newspapers, but they always, pretty much always wrote about Lynn Hirschman. So, and what happened was I published all these, all these um, articles, hundreds of them. In fact, somebody is going to be doing a thesis on all the hundreds of articles I wrote during that time. And um, I took these articles into the, into galleries and it was so unheard of to have a woman, uh, written about in print, and that's how I got my first show <laughs> at the gallery. So um, after these projects, I did something called Lorna. And rather than going through a hotel room to see a character, this was done kind of um, uh, uh, through a video disc. And that's just around the time that, that interactive art video discs or video discs were really made available. Unlike Roberta, whose adventures took place directly in the environment, Lorna was a middle-aged agoraphobic woman who was afraid to leave her apartment. And the premise was the more she stayed home and watched television, the more fearful she became because she was absorbing some of the frightening messages of advertising and news. This piece right now, until April, is going to be up at the, at the Whitney, by the way, in New York. Um, every object in Lorna's room had a number and you had a remote switch. And you sit in the environment of Lorna's room and you could make choices uh, for Lorna. Uh, and decide uh, what you would, how, what, what choices she would make. Um, you could, uh, you activate the live action in a sense by being a surrogate to her. The disc has three separate endings, um, and uh, multiple soundtracks, uh, and you could. Uh, go at various speeds. So in Lorna, she could either stay where she was, commit suicide, or what people in San Francisco thought was the worst option, she, she could move to Los Angeles. <laughs> so um, after Lorna, I did this piece, which is Deep Contact. And this one was one that you touch the screen directly. So on these interfaces, I didn't use keyboards. I wanted to make things just more, going more and more towards the core of what the um, what the piece was, 
And um, again, you could go forward and backwards on this. You touched the woman and created adventures for her. Uh, and you could uh, go into her her history and her future from several points of view without any kind of hierarchy as to what the decisions were. Um, so uh, the idea of uh, these kinds of ideas aren't new. They were explored by other artists like Mallarmé, John Cage, Marcel Duchamp, D Duchamp's music, and they were pioneering 50 years before I did uh, about random adventures and chance operations. And they were doing this before the technology existed that would have uh, made their ideas more fully exploited in their concepts. Um, so uh, deep contact, as I say, for this one uh, invites people to follow their instincts and uh, actually touch this guide uh, on her body and that activates the various paths that, you're, that you take. Um, I was also doing projects like this, which again is cyborgian ideas of being captured by your, uh, having surveillance capture images capture your image and uh, particularly women's bodies and the idea of women becoming empowered to know when their bodies were being um, captured and used by the media. Um, in, uh, 19, in 1888, uh, Etienne Jules Moray per perfected a gun that substituted film for bullets. And this is a camera gun that uh, has a direct relationship not only to the history of film and the eroticization of, of female imagery in photography and, and pornography, but to the kind of horrors our century has perpetrated by weapons and translated into uh, media by cameras. And um, in this piece, which is called America's Finest, it's an interactive M16 rifle and you go up to the, to the rifle and pull the trigger when you pull the trigger your image is put into the gun sight so you become both the aggressor and the victim simultaneously you know there's no separation between um, that action and uh, if you wait the ghost of yourself and the ghost of the history of warfare dissolves like uh, into cycling um, uh, images around you And so around 1994, 1995, um, I uh, started to use the internet, um, actually 1993 in some of these, and the internet became part of the composition of my work. And in here you see on the bottom a doll I made called Tilly the Telerobotic Doll, and the other one which is like Roberta, but it's called Cyber Roberta, and I call the two the Dolly clones. And, and um, they're still active. If you go to lynnhirschman.com uh, or, or uh, if you go to um, doll, dolls.com, you can move, their, you can move their, um, their head around 180 degrees. Uh, so they, um, what they do is that the, one eye is to the room that you're in, the other eye is, has a camera to the internet. So if you stand in front of the, the doll, your image gets translated and put onto the internet. And again, you could move her head by clicking her eyes around the room. So she becomes kind of like a nanny cam surveillance uh, um, entity that I used to use to check on my, um, on my studio while I was traveling. So <laughs> I... Um, So, let's see. Uh, this is Cynthia's stock ticker that was made about 10 years later. And with Cynthia, she has a direct uh, feed to the internet and to the stock market. And she's able to tell kind of what the global temperature is. And when the stock market goes up, uh, the character in it starts to go shopping and dances. If the stock market goes down, uh, she goes to Goodwill and to sell her things and she starts drinking. So it kind of is, is a, a visual marker of how our behavior changes through 
uh, technology, and particularly technology that deals with the money that we might might have just lost. So um, I also started to take uh, to, to make films around that time, uh, and this is a, a, a film that I made in, finished in 1996. It's called Conceiving Ada, and it's about Ada Lovelace who invented the first computer program. So in 1996, there was no information whatsoever about her. Um, and so I decided to make this film just so people would know uh, who she was. And you could still find this film. Um, it still exists uh, online or in other places. I think that one of the most subversive elements of new technology is that it forces real life to transgress space and enter an artificially uh, based environment and therefore it diabolically transfigures the essence of the participant who not only simultaneously becomes artificial through the process but can only be recognized when they're electronically disguised. And a few words about cyborgs, since that's kind of what we're talking about, is that databases and codes are the spine of an evolving cyborgian posture in which identity is provisional and where capture, surveillance, voyeurism, and scopophilia are simultaneously the technique, the subject, and the social medium. My work usually takes between three and 42 years to make um, and almost that long to show. The breathing machines, other than the the two that, that were uh, in that show that got closed, um, most of the breathing machines were not shown for 50 years. I showed them for the first time in a room in 2014. They were made in 1966 and 1968. Um, so, uh, but I think that the process and gestation of having time um, to reflect on what you're doing is an advantage uh, because you're unencumbered um, by the constraints of what Tennessee Williams writes about in his essay called the catastrophe of success. Because <laughs> when Tennessee Williams had his first success successful play, they, they put him up in a fancy hotel room in New York and he wasn't able to write and he had to go down to Mexico City in one room and get rid of everything in order to to, to be able to hear what he was thinking. So uh, let's see. This is another film that, uh, that I made uh, a little uh, a little bit after um, uh, Conceiving Ada again in this one Tilda Swinton plays four parts. She plays Rosetta Stone who's a programmer who clones herself three times and creates these uh, various characters um, uh, that she embodies and uh, to make uh, uh, and uh, these one of these characters which I call uh, self-replicating automatons um, had worked on a Lonely Hearts uh, internet uh, program. Uh, she had a blog and she needed uh, to go out because these um, these three self-replicating automatons could only survive on sperm. So Ruby had to go out and, and uh, capture that every night. <laughs> so as part of Technolust, I wanted to do something that was sort of expanded cinema. So I came up with this idea to create this agent that you would go to see the film in a theater and then in those days you had Palm Pilots and the, what I designed was to have s s uh, a, the character, the Ruby character that had her blog, leap from the screen onto your Palm Pilots so that as you left the cinema you could talk to her. And that actually happened. And this is the piece that's called agentruby.net. It was actually the very first artificial intelligent um, piece ever made as an artwork. I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I used the internet net itself to, we gathered 18 programmers from around the world in order to put her together. I finally gave this piece to the San Francisco Museum of Art because I couldn't afford her upkeep, uh, which was, uh, it was about $2,000 a year to, to man maintain her. So they do that. And believe it or not, she is now the most visited artwork in their museum collection. <laughs> and they did, after 10 years, they exhibited her uh, uh, and they found that this internet piece w was live 
and it was always growing, and this is something I hadn't anticipated, the information that people would write to her, as I said, she had a Lonely Hearts column, um, was recorded and still is. And the museum gathered all the information of that time, and they had something like 80 tons of of messages and paper that people had written to her and they called that down and made made that into 10 books that they exhibited you know which which has subjects like what what it means to be human um uh oh uh, uh, what the economy was, and in, in a sense, she was somewhat like Roberta because she was a reflection of what people were thinking about globally during all of those years. So, if you go to agentruby.net, she should pop up, and you could have a, a conversation with her. Um, yeah, th these are some of the programs that went down to the the uh, uh, Palm Pilot. You know, and, and the, as they say, these pieces are live, and, you, you know, they, they will live longer than we will. Um, and I thought that, uh, or some of us will. Um, I, I thought after I made um, this piece, again, you know, these things, when I made them, nobody knew what to do with them. They didn't, they didn't know how to show them. They, there was no language whatsoever. So they, they pretty much put it in, in a, and people didn't show them uh, and, until the millennials w were born. And thank God for the millennials. So um, I started to think about what more I could do with, with this AI piece. And then I made uh, this piece, which has, uh, uh, it, it's, it, I consider her Ruby's daughter. And we all know uh, that daughters are much more intelligent than their mothers. So, so Dina. Uh, was made in 2004, and she has voice recognition and voice synthesis. And um, the programmer that I used for this also worked in developing the Android, so she she becomes a search engine. You could ta ask her anything, and uh, she'll be able to tell you. So um, uh, uh, she uh, also has mood swings, and uh, engages in covert and constant global conversations. Now, during all of this time, I started to, um, in the mid-60s, from where we began, you know, the, the early transgenic pieces with the um, breathing machines, I was uh, videotaping people that would come into my living room, and I would, bar I didn't own a camera, but I would borrow one, and um, I would these people were part of the feminist movement, and I felt that that was one of the, that, and, and you know what was happening with um, w with integration and the Black Panthers and living in Berkeley and coming into your own autonomy were the most interesting things at that time. So I wasn't a filmmaker in those days, but I wanted to keep some sort of record, like a scrapbook. So over the years, I did uh, something like sixteen thousand hours of interviews, including people you know, that I would start to interview in their 20s. Um, as they say, people like uh, Judy Chicago and Carol Leach Neyman and Suzanne Lacey and uh, uh, Marsha Tucker, and I continue to interview them into their 70s. So all of this information is now at the Stanford Library, and all that all that footage is available to look through and, um, and, and research. Uh, I had a hard time. It took me four years to edit this. It was the only thing I did. And I had a hard time because I couldn't tell which story to tell uh, with all the material I had. But putting it up on the Internet and making it all available, making a film that has no outtakes because it's all available there and, and is a resource. But I finally did finish um, this film called Women Art Revolution, which is the only film that exists on the, on the history of the feminist art world uh, uh, in in the United States, and in most cases, is the only footage of the of of these women that exists, which is pretty shocking. You know, when Marsha Tucker died, there was no other uh, footage that existed except for what I had done as my interview with her. But uh, but at least it's it's there. Now, <laughs> this is the the piece we did last uh, uh, um, May. Is it May? Yeah. So. Um, I was lucky enough to get invited to do some projects at KW, and, um, and Anna Gritz and Catherine Mayer were doing something that 
where they wanted art to take place outside of the museum, which I seem to be an expert at. Um, so we we did kind of a forensic study of a of a of the Novalis Hotel in Berlin, and for this we um, we recreated or it, it was similar to the Dante, but we did a forensic. Um, portrait of, of, of somebody who would have been Roberta's age who would come and stay in that in that room and we also did a kind of forensic um, uh, uh, information of um, of the visitors to that room and simultaneous to that the exhibition that you see here was was up uh, this is just a little piece I did um, uh, last year called Vertigoast um, that was too complicated to explain, so I <laughs> slip over. But uh, um, cyborgian mythology was reborn with a vengeance when, as recently as 1995, living cells were placed into 3D bioprinters. And um, you have a bioprinter, it, uh, it is really like a, 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 a digital printer, except that it uses people's cells and what what you can do now since the gene since dna and the genome have been programmed is um uh replace body parts and print body parts and do uh gene editing and transpose editing of different species into completely new life so for the past uh, about 11 years 12 years, I, I was researching the idea of genetics lab, and I finally finished this piece last July. It's called the Infinity Engine. Um, I'm just going to uh, show you um, a little bit about it. But um, the yeah, the, this actually exists. I didn't make it up. Um, these researchers can use a, a program called CRISPR and and merge together different species uh, for various types of research. Like this was motivated by doing AIDS research and they crossed a jellyfish and a cat. Um, these are, the, here's a bioprinted ear and a nose and, the, uh, and another nose that was actually printed by the man who invented bioprinter and, and he, he made this for my exhibition. Simultaneous to this, I started to work with, um, with Novartis in, um, in Switzerland. And uh, um, what I wanted to do with them was to create an antibody because the new treatment of cancer and other illnesses now is to use the core of, of your own immune system to fight against toxins uh, and disease. Uh, and I think that that's, in a sense, what artists do because I think artists search out toxins in culture and society and try to neutralize them or find a way to to shift them. So I worked with the scientists in at Novartis Labs and we created not only the the Lynn Hirschman antibody but a Roberta antibody. The Lynn Hirschman antibody uh, uh, merged with too many things and, and the Roberta antibody wouldn't merge with anything so they found that really valuable because they never had any any kind of uh, anything that wouldn't uh, adjust to, <laughs> to anyone else, and they're using it for a lot of, of research, particularly um, in, in China. Uh, so the implications of all of this research include not only the, cr uh, the creation of sustainable planet of hybrid life forms that can survive a sixth extinction and incorporate into its extinction a, a morally um, responsible future. Uh, what, and the final thing I did for that, uh, for the genetics lab, uh, which was eight rooms that dealt with various elements of the research that I was doing from bioprinting to CRISPR technology to interviews with scientists, um, is, is what I call here is the, is the, is room number eight. And I took all of the electronic diaries and all of the research that I had been making for about 34 years and condensed it into DNA itself. So you see the DNA was placed inside a, a locked 
lab door with kind of a Eve Klein blue light on it. You couldn't enter the door, but all of the information that that really has been the cons uh, uh, components of my life existed as DNA in this very tiny thing that I could carry in my wallet. <laughs> and this is a, this is a picture of it. Um, and I, I want to, let's see, I want to just end this talk with, um, it's not ended yet, but uh, something that, that Tilda says in Conceiving Ada is, So DNA is the medium of our time. Uh, times have changed since I uh, started to work with the breathing machines, and now they're fully available. Um, and uh, so in, in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, art today has traveled from an omnipotent, limited control of information to a dynamic share, shared experience of community access. And we have now um, been offered new opportunities to participate in our constantly evolving, continually hacked and revised meta-universe, seeking not closure, but expanded aperture for tolerance and connectivity. I get to talk to I get to talk to you guys, right? Que las preguntas están abiertas, o tenéis el el micrófono cuando lo necesitéis, si queréis preguntar algo. Si no, Catherine va a tener que preguntar, o sea que Um so <clears throat> you you call your your alter egos agents and I was wondering because it it was now very it became very much uh logic that your your work um relies on the multiplica multiplication of the self why it almost is like a tool why why do you work or what 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 is the trigger, or what was the trigger to work in that way, to uh, create those alter egos? Um, you mean with the diary, or with Roberta, or with? Because basically, <coughs> what I what I can see is a uh, you conceived Roberta Brightmoor, and then basically the character kind of evolved into the next one, and so on. So there's always like a like a history of the character. Uh, yeah, a genealogy of the character traveling, but I, c I, c I can imagine it's the kind of freedom that they allowed you to to express yourself with, right? Yeah, it's like wearing a mask, and sometimes when you wear a mask, and particularly these masks that were of the times that they were made, um, they allowed you to go into a deeper truth than going out as yourself. Um, in, in which case people wouldn't be as, as clear uh, with you. But, and also you became distant, so it's almost like a Zen-like experience because people would, um, would, would tell you their stories, particularly with, with Roberta. There are a lot of unhappy people that were going out to, to meet her. Um, and you could kind of, kind of analyze it in a different way of being outside uh, her uh, and, and kind of see what 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 the status uh, was of people during that time, and have a, have a different sense of the reality or the multiple realities. You know, because there are you know we do rupture and we do have multiple sense sense of of our individuality. It's never constant. So by creating these masks, these different uh, ways to look at life, I think it gives you a deeper resonance of uh, of truth. Also, what I think is very present is that with this multiplication of the self, you create a sp uh, like a virtual space already with 
um, the Dante Hotel, which is basically uh, a space where everyone could go in, everyone could basically take the key and, and spend as much time there as they wanted to. Um, and at the same time, then when basically the technology has arrived, you use that immediately, you pick it up, and it becomes very um, natural to, to your process. So for me, um, this also comes together with a quite, or what, what, what women artists have done in those days is that basically uh, new media allowed them to explore uh, tabula rasa kind of field because it was not claimed by, by men before, right? So basically it's like what you did is kind of a proto, already proto virtual reality with those explorations of the self. And also, um, I guess, pushing the boundaries of what a woman could do because, uh, well, it's not yourself, it's the other person. And what I find kind of interesting is that today it would not have it would not be that easy to create another persona like that. That's true. Um, first of all, we we invented a lot of the technology. We didn't. We almost never used off the off the shelf technology. I, I did it for for Venus of the Anthropocene, which you showed, and. That, tech, that that facial recognition didn't work. We bought it off the shelf. It was a, a very uh, kind of high-end uh, Chinese-based uh, uh, program that was faulty. <laughs> but but we, you know we spent years and all the things that we did uh, creating things in advance of them being accessible. You know, people didn't use touch screens. There weren't any when I made that. We used HyperCard. People didn't use interactivity. They didn't know what it was to be able to make choices in in looking for things. So, um, uh, but what what you said is true about. Um, I was lucky to have done this in the 70s because somebody tried it in the 80s and they got arrested <laughs> for identity theft. So uh, you you couldn't do it now because uh, you know the uh, the environment's much different and the surveillance environment is much different. And I think that surveillance itself has gone from these external cam uh, cameras and things that I was dealing with in, in tracking uh, Roberta and, and Cyber Roberta, being able to track individuals that were, that, um, and, and ways we were being looked at, both by uh, data supplements as well as external cameras. And now the, I think the new surveillance systems are, are internal and biological and capture you from the inside out. What your DNA is, what the history of your DNA is, what your lineage is, uh, what, what your uh, risk factors are. I want to ask one question to the um, to the central work of the show, the first person plural electronic diaries of Lynn Hirschman Leeson that you did from eighty four till ninety seven six. Well, I actually am finishing them this year. Yeah, so. true. <laughs> That's right. There is another one coming. Yeah. Two. Um, <coughs> so in those, you what you did is you recorded yourself without anyone in the room, so yeah. it's very DIY, and um, you talk about very personal accounts, uh, about uh, trauma, about um, rape, and um, all kind of different violence, you know. Um, but then you also juxtapose it with very, with the very events of that time, politically speaking. Like there is uh, the personal and uh, and the general of the society coming together. Um, so it's basically the very moment where the personal becomes political, but the s vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very big part of your work in general. And also, I mean, we've been talking, I know you're very a very political interested person. What was the first, or what, what, what was the initial idea? What, what brought you to do those recordings of yourself? And then also, I think for me, it's an anticipation of again of what we have as the internet that uh, that everyone can ex express themselves freely on YouTube. If you watch it, it's really like what we have every day. Everyone sharing very personal things. But what was the first um, push? What was the yeah the push that that? Um, I was a single mother, and uh, I was trying to make a living. Uh, 
somebody in my carpool is married to Francis Ford Coppola. It didn't seem that difficult to, to me to, to make a movie. So I, um, I, I was trying to teach myself how to uh, use a camera. So I would borrow cameras, sit down in front of them, turn it on, watch the monitor, and and record myself. I didn't know that I was making a diary. I didn't know what I was going to say. And then I had to, of course, teach myself how to edit. So I used that material, and I didn't have any money to pay anybody else. So I did everything. And that's um, so that was really the impetus because I wanted to find a, a, a survival, a, you know, a way to survive, which in a sense this was a survival uh, mechanism psychologically, you know, would have brought in. But when I looked at what I was, what I was saying, you know, it brought it to a different level. And then when I was able to edit it together, uh, you know, again, it, 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 it changed the shape of, of what we're thinking about. And if I'm thinking about it, who else is thinking about it? And if I go through particular traumas, who else is doing it? And they found that the closer you got to your own truth, the more people that you would reach. And so that that's why I continued doing it. I mean, when I do these things, like with R Roberta, I didn't think it was going to last a decade, you know. And the same with with these, you know, they they just continue and and you continue with the explorations. So I have I could go on have many more questions, but I think I'm gonna. If anyone warmed up, or otherwise, I guess Manuel has also quite some questions. Uh, which changes um, uh, can you identify in the representation of or in, in the um, in your work as a woman artist, uh, referring to work with technology? Uh, since the beginning of your work until today, uh, the evolution of technology uh, involved a new uh, uh, a new shift uh, in the in the way women can work with technology. Two. One other question will be uh, the question uh, about how technologies become obsolete. You worked with some obsolete te technologies like laser disc. How, how do you uh, relate to these works uh, then and today? Well, women have always worked with technology. Women were the uh, it was Ada Lovelace that invented computer programming, and it's something that that. Uh, 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 Babbage and Jacquard weren't able to do in the same way. It was Mary Shelley that invented ar artificial intelligence. It was Hedy Lamarr that invented uh, uh, what now became known as uh, sp spread spectrum technology, which is what we use on our cell phones in order to communicate. But the industry is very male-dominated, no? Yeah, but that, that doesn't say anything about what w women have invented. Men have, have capitalized... Um, on on the commercial value of women's intelligence and and dominated the fields when women didn't have a chance to get jobs <laughs> different now i think i i think it's changed you know the world has changed significantly since that that uh those years and, uh, and about these uh, differences uh, in uh, technologies uh, regarding the different times where, where we were working. That means, uh, uh, for example, today, uh, museums, contemporary art museums became also museums of obsolete technologies. But at the same time, uh, there, there are lots of fetishic, fetishistic questions regarding that. Although, or do you confront this situation about uh, the origin of technologies, the possibility of uh, uh, adaptation to new technologies, etc.? I think that you have a responsibility when you make these pieces, just like you do in painting, you know, to conserve them. And we mi migrate our pieces every three years to new, uh, to new basis f so that they can continue to be exhibited and and my works are uh you know even works that are 50 years old as you see with the breathing machines you you can continue uh to to sh to uh to show and and explore them and they're they're part of the culture in which they're made so you know the medium is different but uh there are conservation methods that will allow you to to keep and maintain them as they once were and it's kind of like an archaeological process because you have to have all these uh the old hardware and the original software and we usually make manuals that are about 150 pages each one that 
each one to tell you how we made them and, and how one could continue in the future, which is something that Klaus Oldenburg did for, for the works that he made. Many other artists have made, uh, made um, descriptions of how their work will continue in time. Frank Lloyd Wright did it for his, his uh, buildings as well. So just last last comment, I think, uh, is more about you know precisely the the different declination of the exhibition here in Madrid than in Berlin. That uh, yeah, as we were talking about before, these museum conditions we have allowed to show these uh, old pieces. You know, like uh, suddenly we have all the pieces down there, no, the breathing machines here, and uh, you know, like they're like a coming back from that past, from that beginning, and at the same time you have the the electronic diaries uh, that I think in Berlin was the first time they got this proportion, no? Like yes. a, a, a rise in a way, no? Like a, becoming a, another way of installation. No? Yeah, in you have to trust your cur curators because they're, <laughs> they're like your daughters, they're usually smarter than you. No, but I think, how, how do you feel? You know, like, a, I don't know if you had time enough, <laughs> but how do you feel about this link precisely between this all the pieces and, and, and you know, like with obsolete uh, technologies that are coming back to life in a way. No, literally, I think, uh, how we install them. Yeah. And, uh, and the relationship with these, you know, mat materials that become precisely translated into another, like a bodily position and phenomenological position in the rooms. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a different way of, um, of seeing the work, I was I I personally was resistant to doing it because I was trying to you know stay academic and show it in, in the original monitors that they were that they were shown in when I made them. But I think it gives you a completely different dynamic when you're dwarfed by the intimacy of these large images. So I'm really grateful that um, I listened to to them. <laughs> Well, okay, so I think we, we just need to, to go up and see the show. Okay. And uh, I want to thank everybody, but mostly you yourself. <laughs> uh, and, and mostly because, you know, like I, I think now it's clear why we were making the show and uh, why precisely because of people like her, uh, you know, museums as like this one exist. So I think, yes, thank you. Thank you.